Hello everyone, I'm George P. Bush, Commissioner of the Texas General Land Office. And I'm Buck Cole, Education Outreach Coordinator for the Texas General Land Office Archives. Before we begin, I want to welcome Ms. Lexi Smith and her students from Athlos Leadership Academy here in Austin, Texas for joining us today to learn about our rich land history and its impact on the development of our great state. Thank you all for being here. Before we begin today's lesson, I just want to see by a show of hands uh, who has recently moved to the state of Texas from another state? Okay, one, two, okay. Yes, sir, what's your first name? Nathan. Nathan, why did your family move here? So I could have better education. Okay, where'd you move from? Atlanta. So your family came here for educational opportunities, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Tony. Tony, nice to meet you. Why did your family move to Texas? My dad got a new job with an old business partner. Okay, wonderful. So he came here for economic opportunity, right? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Well, there's a reason why I asked the question to you, class, because uh, there's a quote to start today's lesson on land opportunities in the state of Texas, and it's from W.M. Cannon, and we have it up on the screen. Every man who fails to come to Texas does injustice to his posterity. This quote is from a letter housed right here at the General Land Office archives written by J.D. Cannon, a Tennessean who came to our state shortly after the state's independence in 1836. Cannon's message to his friends back home is simple yet powerful. People should take advantage of the opportunity that Texas offers for themselves and for future generations. Like others before and since, Cannon was drawn to Texas by an instinctive drive to get ahead in life. During the early 1800s, Texas was sparsely populated, but even then, people like Cannon saw its potential and its opportunity. But what was it that drew him and others to our state of Texas? What would cause families to get their belongings, pack up, and risk uh, their life to come uh, to, to the Republic and undertake the long journey away from friends and family to a foreign country with no guarantees of success? The answer is very simple. The land and the opportunities that Mexican Texas at the time was undeniable that was offered to newly arrived settlers. Before we continue with this quote uh, from Cannon, he talks about posterity. If someone doesn't come to Texas, he does his posterity an injustice. What does he mean by that? Anybody? Anybody know what posterity means? Yes, sir. Yeah, the, the, the people that follow him and his family, right? If you don't come to Texas, the opportunities will be missed by the people who follow you. And that was important to J.D. Cannon. To understand how American immigration impacted the settlement of Texas, we have to go back to 1820. The previous year, the United States had experienced the worst peacetime financial crisis in its short history. Farmers were especially hit hard and a lot of people lost their property and their belongings. To encourage more sales of its public land, though, the United States government reduced the amount of land farmers were required to purchase from 160 acres to 80 acres and reduced the price of an acre of land from $2 an acre to $1.25. So how much land, how much would land cost after 1820 in the United States? Let's see. Anybody know how to do this longhand? I think there was somebody that did it and got the correct answer. Who was it? This gentleman in Seahawks t-shirt. So let's look at 1820 in the United States. How much is an acre of land? One, okay, very good. A dollar 25. And you had, to, you had to have a minimum of how many acres? Very good, 80 acres. So let's see if Mr. Cole can do this longhand, okay? Zero, zero, zero. Zero, 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 one, one place. How much money do you have to have? One yes. One you have to have a hundred dollars. And by the way, no credit, no cash. You had to pay in what? Anybody know? Coins. You had to pay in either gold or silver coins. And you had to pay it all at one time. Okay, so 80 acres, $1.25 an acre, $100, no credit, 
no cash, and you had to pay in either gold or silver at a time when people didn't have that much, did they? Okay. Although this was a way for the United States to reduce the cost of land to help farmers, it also reduced the amount of land farmers could purchase. The law also required full payment at the time of purchase, no more credit. As a result, many Americans began looking for land opportunities elsewhere, and they found it courtesy of the Spanish government and a man from Missouri named Moses Austin. In 1820, Texas remained, if you can imagine it, largely unsettled. The Spanish and later the Mexican government believed that the country needed immigrants to settle and colonize the new uh, Mexican Texas to create strong communities and keep foreign enemies from invading the area. That same year, the Spanish government gave Moses Austin permission to settle 300 families from the United States to Texas. After Moses' untimely death, his son, Stephen F. Austin, might have heard that name, continued his father's plan. A year later, in 1821, Mexico won its independence from the Spanish crown. The introduction and settlement of families in Texas remained a priority with the new government, and their terms were very generous. But why was Texas such an attraction for Americans? Well, it comes down to numbers, as is the case in many things in life. The Mexican government authorized Stephen F. Austin and other empresarios to issue enormous grants of public land. Public land, uh, let's define it as land claimed by a government entity to use for whatever purpose it chooses. Qualified families that came to Texas could own uh, up to a league for grazing or agricultural purposes, up to 4,428 acres, and an additional 177 acres for farmland. But before we talk about huge quantities of acres in land, it's important to know just how big one acre is, okay? How many of you have ever been to a football game? How many of you have been to a football game recently? How many of you have gone to see your brother play or any, anybody? How many, of you know how, how many of you have a football field at your school, okay? This is how big an acre is. An acre of land is 91% of a football field, not including the end zones, okay? So the next time you watch a football game, ask your mom and dad, just tell your mom and dad, Dad, do you realize that an acre of land is 91% of a football field, the playing area? So if this is 100%, 91% would start at what yard line? Anybody know? The nine yard line, very good, okay? So when we talk about thousands of acres or even hundreds of acres, we're talking about one acre being almost a football field, okay? Many of you have probably visited our beautiful state capitol, okay? This is our state capitol as you're diving into it, okay? The, the capitol building sits on 22 acres of dedicated land. How many of you have been to the capitol? Okay, you walk around, it's pretty big space, isn't it? 22 acres encompasses the dedicated land at our state capitol just two blocks away, okay? Now help me remember, what was the maximum amount of land you could purchase in the United States after 1820? Yes, sir? 80. 80 acres, okay? Let's see how large 80 acres is. This is 80 acres, okay? This was 22, this is 80. Is it still a lot of land? It's still a lot of land. When you walk around 22 acres, but 80 acres is huge, isn't it? That's a lot of land that goes outside the perimeter of our state capital, okay? Now, let's see how big, how much land we could get from the Spanish government. Now imagine 4,605 acres. To illustrate how much land that really is, let's take a bird's eye image of the entire city center of Austin, the capital city of our great state. As you'll see, this is the coverage of 4,605 acres over downtown Austin. This is how much land the Mexican government authorized for families, whether they come from the US or other countries at the time, to come to Texas. A family can own an area of land almost the size of 4,605 football fields. That's a lot of geography. Because these land grants were so large, they provided settlers a wide range of options. They could use the land's resources for many reasons, to build a home, to raise livestock, to grow cops. 
They could also sell all or, or part of it and use the money to purchase things that they needed to keep the land as an inheritance or to make money. Land ownership created opportunity that many Americans had never had before. A chance at a better life and a chance at a better way of making a living for their families. And so they kept coming to, to Texas. Before we leave this image, let's talk about this. What's, what city is this? This is Austin. Do you recognize any landmarks on here? Anybody? How many of you? Come up here and show me what you know. What's this road right here? That is I-35. Very good. What else do you see on this image? I see the capital. You see the capital? Now remember we said 22 acres here, didn't we? And then we expanded it to 80 acres. This is how much land a head of family could get if they moved to Texas during the Spanish and Mexican period. Is that a lot of land, guys? What can you do with it? What can you do? What, you can't farm it all. What can you do? Huh? Build homes? What else? What's one thing you could do to make money? Yes. Use it for livestock. You could use it for livestock. What else? You could build a city. Okay. Eventually you could do that. But if you had all this acreage, what else could you do with this land besides live on it? You could do what? You can. You could sell it, couldn't you? You could sell it. And so you could keep this much for yourself and sell the rest. You could divide it in half and give this to your kids and sell that, whatever you wanted to do with it. Because when people came to Texas, many of them didn't have anything. But now, land gave them an opportunity, didn't it? It gave them choices. Now let me show you this. This is 80 acres in the United States, 4,605 in Mexican Texas. 80 acres in the United States, 4,605 acres. Thank you. Thank you very much. You with <laughs> me on this? Thank you. Thank you very much. You had to pay cash. You had to pay up front $100 for 80 acres, 4,605, very little money involved, and you could pay on credit. That's why people came here. After the Texas Revolution, Texas used its enormous public land reserves for payment to soldiers for military service. I'm going to give you an example of that. Who's this guy? Yes, sir. Sam That's Sam Houston, isn't it? How many of you know who Sam Houston is? Sure you do. Okay, if those of you that don't, we'll talk later. Okay? Sam Houston is the first president of the Republic of Texas, right? But he is also a soldier. And during the Texas Revolution, or after we, Texas had no money, we were in debt. How do we pay our soldiers? How do we pay them? Land. With what? Land. Land. We pay them in land, don't we? And this is his authorization. This is Sam Houston's donation certificate for his participation in the Battle of San Jacinto. If you fought in the Battle of San Jacinto, you got 640 acres. And this was Sam Houston's authorization for him to go out and find land. We could not pay them in money, but we could certainly pay them in land. 640 acres, by the way, kids, is one square mile. Okay? Texas ceded or gave millions of acres of land to pay its debt after Texas joined the United States. Texas also used public land to finance the construction of railroad lines that were essential in settling and developing the western part of the state. The sale of public land helped finance canals and roads to improve our state's infrastructure. Public land was even used to finance the building of our state, of our beautiful state capital. But by far the most important use of public land was to help finance public education. Texas set aside millions of acres of land to raise the money necessary to help pay for textbooks and other classroom needs for Texas school children. From the sale and lease of public lands, the state of Texas has awarded the state of Texas more than $16 billion for schools since 1876, a figure that continues to climb. This program is known as the Permanent School Fund, where we have several of our meetings right here. The PSF is managed and maintained by our agency here at the Texas General Land Office and continues to provide educational resources for classrooms across the state. The lure of land and its use in the development of our state is important to the history of this great state. Without the generosity of the Spanish and Mexican governments and hard work on their part, thousands of American settlers may never have had the chance to realize their dreams, but land helped make it all happen. 
So here are some questions to consider as we wrap up today's lesson plan. How would Texas been different without the opportunity to own free land in wide ranging spaces? And how would you have individually personally utilized the 4,605 acres of land? Okay, so let's ask y'all right now, if you had 4,605 almost football fields, what would you do with that land in 1820? What would you do with it? Yes, sir. I would make um, uh, hospitals for more care okay. uh, for the people, okay. and um, I will make uh, more more schools for us to have education, and then the rest I will sell the land for good money. So I so later on I can use it for some uh, some things else. Very good. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Most of the land I'd give to my family. Why would you do that? So they can live with me. Very good, okay. Any other reason? And I would um, I would just ranch with the land okay. and sell whatever land I don't use. Okay, so you could, there's a wide variety of things you could do with anybody else. Yes, ma'am. I would grow crops and build to a lot of houses to make a neighborhood for people to move in. Okay. Could you just sell it for cash? Um, sure you no. could. You wouldn't sell it for cash? Uh, That's okay. Probably, yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. How is it time for us to, now it's time for us to take questions from you. For those of you watching from home or school, you can tweet your question using hashtag SaveTXHistory. Okay? Does anybody have any questions? Any questions about land history? Anybody? Yes, sir. If, how much could I buy land for Texas right now? Uh, you would need a lot of money in Austin, that's for <laughs> sure, okay? You would need a lot of money. It's not like it was in 1820, but I have no idea. I think a, someone who actually buys and sells houses would be able to tell you that, but it's a lot, it's very expensive in this town. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. What would you use the land for? What would I use the land for? Uh, gee, I would probably, since I'm not a farmer or a rancher, I would probably sell it and maybe have just a little bit for myself near some water, some trees, build me a little house, but I'd probably sell the rest. You know why? Because if I sold that land and got money for it, now I can do things I'd never been able to do before in 1820. Instead of having to make my shirts, I can go buy a shirt. Instead of having to make nails, I can go buy nails. And for the first time in my life, I have something I never had before, and that's cash. Okay? Anybody else? Okay. Yes, one more. Was there paper money back then? Yes, there was paper money back then. And why didn't they use that instead of coins? That's a whole different issue, friend. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if we use coins, then that's when you give somebody a dollar in a, in a silver or gold coin, you're, you're transferring something of value. But when you use paper money, that's being backed by something else, and that's a whole different kind of economic thing. One more. What did they use more of, silver or gold coins? You know what, that's a very good question, and if you'll uh, email me, I'll be glad to get somebody can answer that for you, but I just don't know what the answer is to that. Good question, though, very good. Yes? We have questions. Uh, uh, Commissioner, this may be for you. What does the land office do? Well, actually, this is a question I get throughout the state of Texas. Uh, we have 21 functional areas. This is actually the oldest state agency in Texas state government. But we provide, as we talked about, uh, one of the largest source for revenues to public education in the state of Texas. We manage 13 million acres. So if you can imagine that in comparison to the 4,600 that we just talked about, it's a pretty large uh, footprint, roughly the size of West Virginia. We also take care of the needs of our military veterans. 1.7 million veterans live in the state. And we also uh, maintain 45 million documents and archives right here in the Stephen F. Austin, including the management of the Alamo in San Antonio. OK. 
Okay, we have one more. I heard there was a war at the land office. Can you tell me about it? Um, how many of you heard of the archives war? Okay. 35 million documents in 45,000 maps we have here, but at the time it was much smaller. But at the time, Sam Houston, who was president of the Republic of Texas, said, we don't want the Capitol to be in Austin. I want the Capitol to be in Houston, but I have to have all those important papers first. So he brought up some Texas Rangers, they brought a wagon, and they quietly unloaded or loaded boxes of archives, those old documents, into those wagons and quietly tried to get out of town and move those documents to Houston so that could be the new capital. But before they could get out of town, a lady named Angelina Eberly fired a cannon to alert the townspeople in Austin that, that something was going on and it's not a good thing. And by the time the Rangers got the wagon to present day Round Rock, the townsfolk in Austin caught up with them and they demanded the documents back. So they had to turn the wagon around and bring the archives back to Austin where they've remained ever since. Otherwise, Houston might be our capital instead of Austin. Well, yeah, we have one more. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, you want to take this? How do people know what happened way back when? Well, that's a very important question, and that's uh, something that our team here does a great job of, and that's preserving, conserving the original documents and items that uh, what we call primary sources in Texas state history that we, we can document and, and verify that these, uh, these activities, in fact, happened. So whether it was the land office activities or the wars in which that were waged here in, in Texas, because of our management of these documents, we're able to preserve that history for future generations. Okay. And uh, a student from Anderson Chiro Consolidated Independent School District tweets, how many people came to Texas during the early 1800s? I don't know the exact figure, but we will find that out. But it was thousands of people that came between 1821 and 1836. And many of them came here illegally, by the way. You were supposed to come from someone else, somewhere else and bring certificates of character and that kind of thing to show you what kind of person you were. But a lot of people just came across the Sabine River, and so we don't really know exact, but I think we can find an approximate amount of people who came here during that time. And uh, email us, and we'd be glad to answer that question for you. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Now, before we go, we have one more thing we'd like to show you, and this is mostly for the teachers watching. This is the Texas General Land Office education website, txglo.org slash education. This is a new website just released this year, loaded with lesson plans about Texas history and the coast, just like the one we taught today. We hope you'll take advantage of these free resources. If you have any questions about the lesson plans or our educational resources at the land office, you can email me directly at buck.cole at glo.texas.gov. Actually, we have time for maybe two more questions. Okay. Would you hold those for me? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, who is your favorite Texan? Well, in our last lesson plan, I shared with uh, everyone that I, I, my favorite Texan is Nolan Ryan, uh, the legendary baseball pitcher with the Texas Rangers, now with the Astros organization, but uh, just an honorable man and uh, a great Texan. For me, it would be Stephen F. Austin. That sounds like it's, it's you know, a stereotype or cliche, but it certainly, to me, would be the, the pivotal person in Texas history. He's the one that created the five colonies in South and on, along the coast of Texas. He's the one that uh, did uh, all the business between Mexico and the Anglo settlers. He tried to make it work before the Texas Revolution, but he was a great man in his own right just for doing that. On behalf of the Texas General Land Office and its employees, thank you for tuning into this live history class. It's been a pleasure teaching you today and hopefully learn something new. Thank you very much.